Welcome back. Uh, to continue this afternoon, we'll be moving on to our next session, Immuno-Oncology 2021 and Beyond. Our moderator this afternoon will be Dr. Mike Titel, Professor and Director of UCLA Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center. Once again, the Q&A function is available at the bottom of the screen and Jujima is available on your phone or as a web app. Uh, thank you, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Titel. Thank you very much, Matthew, and hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Um, today, we're going to have a really exciting panel, as you heard Matthew introduce, and we're going to hear from five leaders who have unique experiences and perspectives on the state of immuno-oncology and some of their thoughts on what's ahead for translating research in academia and industry into increasingly effective immunotherapeutics. Um, I'm Mike Titel, as you heard. I'm the director of the UCLA Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center, and I'm trained as a pediatric and neonatal pathologist. Um, I'd like to introduce members of our panel just briefly today and then launch into some of the questions that we'll begin to discuss. So first is Dr. Mohammed Abu Elanin. Uh, he's at the US USC Keck School of Medicine and is an inaugural <laughs> executive director of the Joint USC Children's Hospital LA Cell Therapy Program. He also serves as director of the new cellular GMP facility for cell and gene therapy on the health sciences campus. He oversees the development of a one-stop shop translational platform that assists uh, investigators in bringing their basic work in cell and gene therapies into clinical testing. Uh, welcome, Mohammed. Uh, next is Yvonne Chen. Uh, Yvonne is an associate professor of microbiology, immunology, and molecular genetics, an associate professor of chemical and biomedical engineering, and co-director of the UCLA Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center's Tumor Immunology Program. Yvonne's lab focuses on applying synthetic biology and biomolecular engineering techniques to developing cell-based therapies, with a particular interest in engineering multifunctional T-cells <clears throat> that can accurately identify and effectively eliminate tumor cells. Welcome, Yvonne. Next is uh, Dr. Robert Rickert. <clears throat> Robert is the Senior Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer of RENOT, uh, Pfizer's Immuno-Oncology Research Unit <coughs> uh, within the Oncology Research Group in Worldwide Research and Development. In 2017, uh, Dr. Rickert joined Pfizer from the Sanford Burnham Previs Medical uh, Discovery Institute in La Jolla, where he was professor and director of the program on tumor microenvironment and cancer immunology, associate dean of the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences uh, and director of academic affairs. So welcome, Robert. Uh, Dr. Stephen Rosen uh, is the Provost and Chief Scientific Officer of the City of Hope National Medical Center. He's Director of City of Hope's Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, he is Director of the Beckman <coughs> Research Institute uh, at City of Hope uh, and Director of the uh, Manella Graduate School of Biological Sciences. Dr. Re Rosen sets the scientific direction at City of Hope, shaping the research and educational vision for my biomedical research, uh, treatment, and education. His main areas of research involve development of new treatments, particularly for hematologic malignancies. Welcome, Steve. Thanks, Mike. And, and finally, unfortunately, uh, on the schedule, I believe, Uda Dugan was uh, listed today, but she can't be with us. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have Dr. Marco Spasic, uh, who is Director of Clinical Science and Safety at the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy. Dr. Spasik's uh, focus is on delivering novel uh, therapeutic approaches, innovative trial design, and understanding and monitoring treatment responses, uh, with the healthcare community driving him to work at the interface of medicine, uh, science, and business. Uh, welcome, Marco. Nice to see you. So I'll kick off the panel by asking a question. I'll direct this to Yvonne to begin. Um, so Yvonne, you, you trained as an engineer and are one of the more basic scientists on today's panel. Uh, can you describe your experience in translating uh, a fundamental lab-based technology into the clinic? Sure. Um, for, thank you for the question, and, and it's a pleasure to be here on this panel. So um, as you mentioned, my, my training, all of my degrees are in chemical engineering. So my, my sort of venture into immunotherapy um, is really out of interest in sort of uh, medical applications of biomolecular engineering efforts. And, um, it, you know, I think for, for sure, it's been a steep learning curve, right? Needing to apply a different set of background training to this area. But I think the great thing about immuno-oncology and I guess biomedical um, 
research in general is that if you can define a very exciting problem, um, there are ways to think about how do you solve that problem with the knowledge and the resources that you have. And I think being at UCLA has also been a, a, a great sort of fortune in the sense that we have a very collaborative community here. And so even though I started my career here as an assistant professor in the School of Engineering, I have been able to interact with a lot of colleagues throughout UCLA in the School of Medicine, as well as at the hospitals, such that we've been able to develop CAR T cell therapy um, from really DNA plasmid design and actually take it all the way to the clinic. Um, so we're running, we, we actually started the first investigator initiated um, clinical trial on CAR T cell therapy here at UCLA. And the trial is going very, very well using a CD19, CD20 bispecific card to treat patients with lymphoma. Um, and so I think this really is a testament to not only the resources, but, but the overall structure here at UCLA that enables us to really take ideas from the lab and take it all the way to the patient um, and to be able to do so with a lot of support, not only on the clinical side, but also on the regulatory side and for cell-based therapy, there's also GMP manufacturing, which is a really non-trivial piece and I think all of these elements really need to fall into place uh, with the right people, with the right resources. Um, but I'm happy to say that it has been doable. And uh, I think the institution has always been looking forward to expanding our capacity uh, to do so. And, and we're very excited to be a part of that. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, Maybe I can turn to Robert uh, for a second. Uh, so Robert, uh, for many years, uh, you led an academic research group uh, that studied the immune system develop its development and function before moving to uh, Pfizer in 2017. Uh, could you describe uh, what you see as opportunities and challenges uh, in modulating the tumor microenvironment as a tool to attack major cancer types based on your experience? Uh, yeah, where do I start? Um, there's, there's numerous challenges, of course. I think um, we're fascinated by the immune system. I think the same things that draw our fascination, the array of molecular mechanisms, the various cell types that are cooperating to usher in an immune response against a, uh, a, a foreign pathogen. Um, that complexity also, I think, thwarts us in the, in the therapeutic realm. That is... Um, we're trying to understand that the tumor microenvironment as, uh, as a lymphoid organ um, of sorts and the various cell types that are within or can be recruited to that microenvironment. Um, and not just in an activatory sense. I mean, certainly T cells are playing a dominant role there, but also the immunosuppressive mechanism. So we have to keep this balance of what's activating anti-tumor immunity, what's potentially dampening it or on in the area of immunosuppression, and you can break that down into multiple areas. And that's just kind of the cellular elements, which are fascinating. But then in the drug development world, ultimately, um, we have to choose an entity that we think we're gonna, is going to have a, a large therapeutic impact. That is the target and how to modulate it. So I think that's the, the major challenge, in a sense, is that we want to choose a target that can deliver ideally a, a certain amount of single agent efficacy. And then given the complexities that I just mentioned, it's likely going to be needed to be delivered to, in combination with other drugs to really uh, realize the full potential of, of, that, uh, of that new drug. So a good, a good uh, and common consideration is, you know, a PD-1 or a PDL one or a CTLA-4 in combination with another uh, new molecular entity. So I think it, it certainly takes a different view of the cancer problem. You know, at, at Pfizer, uh, the company grew up as a medicinal chemistry company. So biologics, which um, is part, but not all of our, of our work, you know, it takes a different mindset in terms of trying to define the target. And again, trying to incorporate all those elements to, to usher in an anti-tumor response. Um, also, given the fact that that patients, of course, and the tumors that they bear, there's incredible uh, heterogeneity. Thanks, Robert. Uh, Steve, so you're a longtime uh, medical oncologist and a preeminent cancer center director at City of Hope. 
Um, can you share with us some of your thoughts on how precision medicine uh, can be integrated into immunotherapies against cancer? Thanks, Mike. Uh, when I first joined City of Hope, and it's still true today, our two priorities have been precision medicine and cellular therapeutics. Uh, that's obviously CAR-T, but also allo transplantation, and then even the use of uh, checkpoint inhibitors or now bispecific antibodies. And we've tried to link both the precision medicine activities as well as the cellular therapeutics. In precision medicine, uh, we're defining new targets. There's also the mutational burden that a tumor may have, which leads to a significant antigenic diversity, which may make the tumor more sensitive to immunologic therapies. Uh, we also can dissect pathways because as we learn more about uh, the particular cancer and the therapeutic options, knowing the pathways become critical when you're deciding how you can combine agents in order to get the maximum response. And this uh, area has, has been so exciting and to see the remarkable progress just in the last five years, it's uh, hard to imagine where we'll be in another five years. Now, having said that, I am mainly in the blood cancer space and even in the blood cancer space where we've seen these dramatic responses, if you look at large cell lymphoma, it's only a third of patients, say, with CAR-T therapy that have long, durable remissions. So there's much work to be done. And clearly, uh, in the solid tumors, uh, in particular, as it relates to cellular therapeutics, uh, we have a, a significant challenge ahead of us. Uh, but it's a very exciting time. Thanks, Steve. Marco, could I turn to you for a second? So uh, you're the Director of Clinical Science and Safety uh, at the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy. <clears throat> and you have a unique perspective in cancer immunotherapy at the interface of academia, philanthropy, and the commercial sector. Uh, could you comment on this intersection between these cultures and what unique opportunities may arise to advance cancer immunotherapy uh, from this confluence? Happy to and incredibly excited to be on this panel. Again, uh, Uta sends her regards that she's not able to join here. And I'm stricken by initial comments that I hear across the board and how much overlap there is in the type of collaborative engine that we're trying to build. So to give some context, at least in reply to that question, for those that are less familiar with the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy, or PICE, this was founded approximately five years ago, namesake Sean Parker. And the goal is really to advance immunotherapy broadly. This involves helping establish new knowledge. So our investment in early stage researchers, a lot of the philanthropy and enabling research. So some of our young investigators giving funds to the actual sites and centers, seven of the top cancer centers across the US where we have esteemed investigators that are generating incredible findings such as Yvonne Chen that's on this call and panel today. And then moving from there on top of uh, enabling knowledge, we also wanted to help translate much to what Robert was talking about in establishing a vertically integrated set of translational assays. So they can really understand what each of these pathways are doing, which each drug is contributing, and better create that ability to move from a specific idea or hypothesis towards something that's actionable. Then we have the bioinformatics capabilities that we've established in-house, where we have put all of this together into an interpretable mechanism called CANDLE. So how do we take these disparate portions of information and start to understand them and analyze them? And lastly, what we've established in-house is the ability to hold an IND to be a sponsor and to run these trials. We've intentionally picked different areas that are traditionally harder to address. So castration-resistant prostate cancer, GBM, pancreatic cancer, and really focused on how can we facilitate collaboration across organizations that invest in these, whether it be a 1440, a loose garden, et cetera, in pancreatic cancer, the academics that are on the scientific side to help design our translational assays, clinicians to help inform where our combination should go, and then our industry partners to figure out which assets may be on the table to combine, and acknowledging what many have said here, that there's tremendous complexity of these tumor types that we need to work together to address, whether that be heterogeneity, mechanisms of resistance or otherwise. And now that's only compounded by incredibly exciting therapies that have surfaced as of recent, the cellular therapies with their challenge around manufacturing, regulatory, patient selection, 
for the incredible excitement of the data that they've done in the hematologic space. So here we think it's not just necessary, but or not just needed, but it's really critical that across nonprofit, private, philanthropic, philanthropic uh, individuals that we come together because the complexity deserves that we all do so. Thank you, Marco. Uh, Mohammed, turning to you for a second. So you're the director of a cell therapeutics program uh, and you have some unique insights into cell manufacturing and academia. So could you share with us how you'd characterize the role academia is and can play in biomanufacturing of immuno-oncology therapeutics? Um, thanks, Mike. And I would like to echo my colleagues in thanking uh, the organizers for inviting and putting this panel together. So uh, this is a very important and crucial point to, to highlight. And uh, I, I'm, I'm very grateful that you asked it because if, if we look back at most of cell-based immunotherapies for cancer, they actually only started as academic developments and progressed in later stages into industry-sponsored ones. Therefore, as Yvonne uh, um, mentioned earlier, I think academia is the incubator for therapeutic innovation. And adding to academia uh, manufacturing and clinical trial infrastructures further strengthen this role. Um, for example, like this is what we are striving to achieve at USC with the uh, new Legion B or good manufacturing practice uh, facility that is currently under construction. And having such capabilities can provide a, a, a more mature ecosystem for translational research uh, in academic environment and developing these innovative cell-based immunotherapies uh, through various stages of clinical trials. Uh, as well as you know, utilizing some of the most advanced analytical and, and proof of principle approaches, which are developed uh, uh, with for, from other colleagues in, in the academic uh, setup as well. So it is, I think it is definitely a big win for LA academic environment that we enhance and, and increase our biomanufacturing capabilities in the region. Thanks, Mohammed. So I have a, a fair number of questions, but I have a really good question that came from one of the audience members. And so I'll ask it uh, to everyone and maybe we'll go in reverse order and we'll start with Mohammed. Um, so the question is, which emerging immuno-oncology targets are you most excited about based on preclinical and clinical evidence? Um, yeah, again, this is an excellent question. I, I'm sure my colleagues here will have better answers uh, given that they are more involved into the basic science of things. But for me, uh, the transition to solid tumors and targets in uh, prostate cancer and uh, breast cancer, I think it's very exciting what we are seeing. And I see that there is a very promising uh, targets that are very close or already in clinical trials, which will yield uh, very promising results. Thank you, Marco. I think uh, we might somewhat keep our cards to our chest, but for me, uh, a bit tongue in cheek, my answer here is going to be the, the one that works. And by the one that works, it's not just clinical data and clinical outcomes, but that can positively modulate human physiology and help inform potential combinations or sequencing. As a class that we're particularly excited about of therapies, it's the application of cell therapy to solid tumors and navigating some of those challenges not necessarily just the target on the tumor cell itself, but what orthogonal mechanisms of resistance can we also in tandem address whether on that cell therapy or in combination with it that I think we're pretty excited about here. Thank you, Marco. Steve? Steve, you're on mute, sorry. I apologize. There's one I can't share that I'm particularly excited about from our lab, but uh, if anybody's interested, they can contact me and I'll, we'll sign all the agreements and we can talk about it. But uh, I can give you one clinical example in uh, cutaneous lymphomas where we have a very large program. We have a trial looking at an anti pdl one with or without lenalidomide. And we know the combination because we did an initial phase one, two trial with the combination, dramatic responses, some durable now over two years, which you don't see in this disease. Um, and it appears in the early analysis that the combination is critical and that the individual agents don't give you the same response. So I, I'm particularly interested in how you combine 
these uh, therapeutics. Thank you. Robert? Yeah, I guess I would take a step back um, to say that I'm, I'm buoyed by the fact that um, I think we're, we're now addressing a number of really intriguing um, clinical hypotheses. That is a number of immune mechanisms um, to see how they may be incorporated either alone or in the context of other, of other therapies. I mean, I touched on immunosuppression before, but you know, the, the CD47 efforts, uh, the don't eat me signal, um, there's some, uh, some new agents, new modalities such as oncolytic viruses that are getting more attention. Um, and even, you know, I think that we were, uh, the field had a bit of frustration around the co-stimulatory molecules and uh, checkpoints and thought that maybe we um, overinvested in that aspect of IO. Um, but, you know, some of the new findings with, with Lake 3 and, uh, and Tigit have been encouraging. And I think the other thing in that realm is that uh, we're starting to understand the patient population better. So we can really refine those expectations of how to deliver these, uh, deliver these modulators in the appropriate context to the appropriate uh, stratified patient population that, that bears particular biomarkers. So I think it's been uh, much more hypothesis driven in that sense. Thank you, y Yvonne. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, our view certainly, my view certainly is a little biased by my own sort of research interests. I think the, the specific target, of course, varies depending on the disease of interest. Um, we have been particularly interested in the concept of how do you modify the tumor microenvironment um, in addition to just simply attacking the tumor, right? And so in that sense, we, for example, have been very interested in targeting TGF-beta, which plays a major role in um, providing an immunosuppressive microenvironment in a variety of solid tumors. And so this sort of starts to diverge a little bit from the more traditional approach of going after antigens that are found on the surface of the tumor cells and or, or in some cases, you know, mutated kinases, et cetera. In this case, we're really thinking about the environment as a whole. How do you modify it so that you can potentially attract endogenous immune responses? And that can now start to allow us to address diseases that could potentially be highly heterogeneous and therefore very difficult to tackle with sort of a specific targeted therapy um, that only goes after a particular antigen or a particular protein. And so that's something that we're very interested in and I think has a lot of potential in this area. Thank you, I'll, I'll mix it up a little bit. So Steve, um, can you comment on clinical resistance to immunotherapeutics? Uh, so that is really the Achilles heel. Uh, you know, the reality is with many of these therapies, if you're targeting a specific antigen, you may lose the expression of the antigen. So there, uh, one of the conceptual aspects is to target more than one antigen at the same time. Uh, people have commented on the tumor microenvironment being immunosuppressive. How do you change the microenvironment so it's not immunosuppressive? Uh, we have a long way to go in terms of uh, dosing issues, not only, not only the dose given, but how frequently to do many of these therapies. We talked about the combination uh, considerations that if you're going to have effective therapies, you may have to hit uh, multiple pathways. Uh, I think these are probably the greatest challenges. And then there's the practical aspect that if you're doing something like CAR-T therapy, you have to develop the CAR-T uh, which can take weeks, if not longer, in an individual patient. And meanwhile, the patient's disease is progressing and you have to contend with that. And so the question is what therapies are given in between? And also should you have off the shelf, treat shelf treatments like natural killer cells or analogenic uh, products? Uh, it's all an evolution. Uh, the exciting part is it's evolving so quickly um, that literally every week in our journals, you see some new insight that's important. Thank you. Um, Marco, um, what are some of the current thinking, at least in PICE and the interactions that you guys have had with both uh, academia, industry partners, and, and uh, sponsors uh, in, in your area? Uh, that's uh, the current thinking basically in, in, in making tumors more visible to the immune system. You mentioned some very hard targets in cancer. I wondered if you'd 
I'd like to share that comment, some comments with us on that. Yeah, a, a lot of concepts there and a lot of comments to unpack. I, I think just purely taking an immune type angle here and acknowledging these concepts of a cold tumor versus a hot tumor and how you define that is uh, variable. But uh, part of that is at least figuring out, as I had mentioned earlier, not necessarily what the drugs do in terms of response for the patient, but what other components can you bring to the mix in establishing these combinations as Yvonne and Steve were bringing up. So how can you understand how to, for example, promote CD8 infiltration or how to actually promote the CD8 cells to be as effective as possible when they arrive. And we're seeing a lot of exciting approaches to that and seeing some positive data, some of which uh, we will be actually be presenting at the upcoming ASCO. So I encourage everyone to take a look there. Thanks, Marco. Um, Mohammed. Um, can you share with us some of the trends that you're seeing now in biomanufacturing of cancer immunotherapies? Um, sure. Um, yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, I, I, like, I like what Steve was just mentioning now because this will help me actually to transition to this point. Because, like, I will, of course, take our T-cells as one of the most prominent examples. And um, as of now, as we know, there are like five commercially available CAR T cells. And uh, therefore, uh, the manufacturing process of these products has been transitioning from academia to industry. So if I would sum up what I see as recent trends in biomanufacturing, I would, I would sum them up into three actually main areas. So uh, the first one would be shifting from open uh, to functionally closed systems. So as, as we know, traditionally open systems such as, you know, the tea flasks and the gas permeable culture bags uh, were the one used for CAR T cell expansion. But now we can see uh, newly developed semi-closed bioreactors uh, entering the market. Uh, the second point would be uh, the replacing the manual processing, which goes hand in hand with shifting from open to functionally closed system. So replacing manual processing with automation. And again, we see devices without mentioning names uh, that are now able and capable of isolating T cells and performing all the subsequent steps, including genetic modification, all in one system with minimal human interference. Uh, the third point is echoing what Steve was mentioning, which is uh, moving from autologous to allergenic products. Again, as we know, all the commercial CAR T cells are based on autologous cells, which is patient-derived, and this may limit the scaling and uh, plus other limitations pertaining to using cells from uh, heavily treated cancer patients. So now, now, we, now there are efforts to produce CAR T cells from healthy donors, which uh, is an allergenic approach. But again, this also suffers from its own limitations. Thank you. I'd also like to uh, suggest to the audience, um, this is a great opportunity to ask uh, five really uh, outstanding experts in the area uh, questions that you may have uh, in mind in relation to immuno-oncology. And so please use the Q&A uh, section at the bottom of the, of the uh, Zoom uh, image uh, to send those questions uh, in and we can, we can get them answered for you. So Yvonne, um, what do you see are some of the key challenges that currently limit the efficacy of CAR T cell therapy? Uh, sure. So I think this has been mentioned a couple times. CAR T cells have done quite well against B cell malignancies, um, hem hematological cancers. T cell leukemia and lymphoma is a, a little bit more difficult because of the fact that the, the, the therapeutic candidate themselves can commit fratricide. But really the big question is how do we make CAR T cell therapy work um, in solid tumors, which account for about 90% of all cancer diagnoses and deaths. And I think there, there are a few um, parameters to consider, right? Um, first, uh, what antigen are we going to target? And this obviously was a question that was raised earlier. I think the difficulty here is usually the, the marker that's high, you know, the ideal marker is something that is highly expressed, uniformly expressed on tumor cells and not expressed on healthy tissue that we cannot live without. 
And just those three criteria eliminate almost all antigens that we know about. And so one challenge there is how do we design therapeutics that is sufficiently specific, but also sufficiently efficacious so that the tumor cannot escape very easily. To that end, there have been a lot of engineering efforts on building what I call Boolean logic gates, right? So can you engineer T cells that can recognize antigen A and antigen B? And both of those need to be present in order for the T cell to call the target an actual tumor. Um, that increases specificity, for example, um, but that in turn can, can uh, make it more um, susceptible to antigen escape because the tumor can then just lose one or the other. And so one has to always balance those two um, considerations. Another, another challenge with solid tumor is access. How is, the, how is the therapeutic, be it a T cell or a small molecule or biologic drug, how is it going to actually reach the tumor cells? right? Um, and depending on the modality of the IL therapeutic, the way to make that happen obviously uh, changes. But that I think is a major uh, problem that, that needs to be overcome. The third layer is once the, the therapeutic reaches the tumor, how does it penetrate the tumor? So that's a sort of second layer of access issue, right? Um, we've seen these beautiful IHC images of you know, T cells surrounding a tumor, but just couldn't get in, right? And so there, that, that aspect of access uh, starts to involve considerations of immunosuppression, right? Both physical barriers, as well as chemical barriers that's present in that environment. And so I think these three things, antigen choice, accessibility, accessibility of the tumor, and how do you actually infiltrate the solid tumor are three main sort of challenges that I think really need to be addressed for us to have effective um, strategies against solid tumors. Thanks, Yvonne. So Steve, you've been uh, intimately involved in, in the development and application of immunotherapies. And, and there's a question from the audience, uh, it takes us a little bit away from the hardcore science, but the question is, what are some of the efforts in place that might balance the cost of these precision immunotherapies uh, and the, uh, to the patients that we're caring for uh, with, uh, with their benefits? So part of it would be technological advances. As everyone knows, you know, a decade ago when we started to sequence the human genome, the cost was prohibitive and now it's cheap. It's unbelievable how that, that transformation occurred. And the other is competition, that uh, sort of the American way that you let people compete based on both the product and the cost. And hopefully uh, there won't be collusion that drives up the cost of, of some of these products. Um, but I think that those are the only two uh, thoughts I have related to this particular issue. I think it's very hard to, to put in regulations that um, interfere with innovation. Um, and one of the I think the observations for all of us this last year was how quickly the vaccines were developed for COVID-19 when we collectively said, let's get this done and let's get the barriers out of the way. Uh, it was quite remarkable. Thank you. Uh, you. You went there, so I'll go there with Robert. Um, uh, you went to vaccines and, and, and activating the immune system. Robert, any thoughts on, we focused very heavily on cellular immunotherapy. What about uh, humoral immunotherapy or cytokines in the environment that can help? Yeah, I think um, in terms of areas, and I sh maybe I should have mentioned this before in terms of, of hot IO targets, I think the, that cytokines um, is certainly receiving a lot of attention. I think it's it's really appealing, as we all know, because of the very potent activity of these cytokines. It's also pretty daunting because cytokines are typically meant to be delivered across synapses, cell-cell contacts. So how do you deliver that sy uh, systemically? But um, for example, there's, you know, the, the second generation IL-2 drugs look quite promising in terms of targeting those, those agents to NK cells and effector T cells and and avoiding um, T regs in the con in the cancer setting, um, or doing the opposite in the uh, autoimmunity setting. So I think that uh, cytokines are hold great appeal. Um, there's also challenges, of course, because of their their pleiotropy, 
and, and trying to modulate the desired um, effector function. Um, but the other aspect also is that uh, there's a number of new technologies in terms of, of how to synthesize and deliver them, synthetic cytokines, et cetera, which kind of touches on another new area of um, instead of trying to infer how did the immune system can operate based upon fundamental knowledge, let's focus on certain aspects that we're trying to achieve, mechanisms that we're trying to um, see play out in, in patients and take it more from a synthetic immunity point of view. Uh, design our drugs such that they can deliver um, exactly what we like to do um, and avoid some of the negative side effects. And I'm thinking mainly from, from more systemic delivery, but this has played out quite nicely in the adoptive T-cell therapies because you, you, know, you have that entity, that's, that cellular platform that you can manipulate and then deliver to the patients. Thanks, Robert. So, Marco, I mentioned this unique uh, position that you sit with Piscean, and a question came through that you know triggers my thought to ask you: What's the role that you see for academics in translating novel cell-based therapies versus allowing or enabling industry and the burden of the cost of IND enabling studies and early phase trials? Where do you see that sort of balance? It's a costly and complex process and appreciate the question. I think Mohammed actually had a great comment earlier that serves to this, that the academics are, are really the incubators of a lot of the technology of a lot of the ideas. But right now the infrastructure isn't there to facilitate academics, nor is uh, the ability to do industry caliber drug development across testing a lot of the different environments and contexts that these complex systems would require. So I think that it's more a question of when the infrastructure is established, which many academic institutions are doing so, and how to bring into the mix the interface between the academics and these industry partners to take those incubated ideas and realize them with some of these industry level capacities that need to be established. I'm curious though what my colleagues on either end of the spectrum there, Yvonne and Steve from the Academic Road and then uh, Robert on the other end might think. Steve, you have your hand up. <laughs> think specifically about what Marco, what aspect? So I think where we place um, the burden of developing some of these cell therapies between academics and industry, oh, just knowing course. the complexity of the process. Uh, I think in many ways, it's a partnership. Uh, in academics, we can come up with creative ideas. At City of Hope, we're fortunate we have GMP facilities. So we can take it a little bit farther, but the reality is we can only take it so far. Uh, we need an ac a commercial partner to really realize the potential of our discoveries. And for Industry, you're sometimes capable of doing everything, but ultimately you need the access to patients and you need for us to be able to um, deliver the therapies and evaluate their efficacy and toxicity. Vaughn? Yeah, I, I, this, this is actually a, a remarkably complicated question. Um, and so maybe I'll break it down in terms of pros and cons, right? So. I've had the privilege of taking something from the lab to the clinic. And in that process, we've had to learn a lot of things that I was not trained in and uh, had not expected to learn, but I'm terribly glad that I did learn, right? So having to establish the GMP manufacturing process and seeing what can happen and how every patient's product is different um, actually gave us a lot of ideas and taught us a lot about things that we probably should have thought about upstream that we never thought about because it was not something that was on our radar at all, right? And so I actually see a lot of advantage in the researcher taking something all the way through so that you see how your technology will eventually be implemented and how some details that seem really trivial at the upstream development stage became incredibly important downstream, either because of technical issues or because of IP, which honestly you, you're not thinking about 
when you're developing the construct up front, right? And, you know, I think as scientists, a lot of times, and I think rightly so, we think about what is scientifically interesting, but at the end of the day, when you don't have the funding to take it all the way through the clinical trials and then onto the market, that technology doesn't make it to the patient. And we want it to make it to the patient if it's a truly good technology. And that's why I think some of these lessons that we've learned have been really valuable. At the same time, I also do think that a lot of these things can be done much, much more effectively, much more efficiently by a professional team, right? And so one of the reality is, realities is we train, we train people in manufacturing and then we lose them to companies that can pay a lot more, right? And, and so it's a, it's a constant struggle to maintain a high quality, uh, highly competent team in order to perform this kind of work. And so I think there, you know, I am actually not quite sure what the right answer is, right? I think partnership certainly is the right word for it, um, but how that partnership should look like, I think takes a lot of thinking uh, to figure out. Thanks, Yvonne. Uh, turn to Robert and then I'll have a question for you, Mohammed, that's come to mind from this discussion. Robert, your thoughts? Um, so yeah, certainly a complex question, um, varies a lot. I mean, we could, we could focus on, on cell therapies and, you know, my time at Pfizer, we, we, uh, we worked with the allogeneic T cell platform and, and learned a lot along the way. It's a constant learning process there. I think that with working with the academic community, you reach a point where I think there's a kind of a, a, a natural overlap where you're, you're mutually enabling. Um, so to advance the project, you need that industry partner. The industry partner can really facilitate certain aspects. Um, and then I think getting back to the academics and the clinical investigators, you know, getting them, them excited about, you know, again, the, 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 the therapeutic opportunity, um, it, it comes full circle. But uh, certainly the, the particular modality has a lot to do with it and the and the associated complexities. Thank you, and I thank the audience too, sending in some really wonderful questions. So I'll have uh, a question from Mohammed, then a question for everyone, and then a final question for everyone. So, uh, Mohammed, so we've heard a lot about sort of where do you put things and how do you manufacture products that can get the patients. What do you think about the current clinical development model for cancer immunotherapy? And is it fulfilling its purpose or is there things we have to rethink here? Um, thanks, Mike. Th this is an excellent, excellent point. And, and, but first, before, before I get to this, I want to thank Yvonne for summing up exactly how um, the challenges be between partnering with industry as an academic institution and setting up your uh, translational capabilities. Actually, she, she described it perfectly. And I want to thank her for that. And I, but I want to add, which to what she said, which addressed your question, how we as academic institution can also strengthen the clinical development model. Because what you mentioned is very, is very actually very critical. Uh, as we know, you know, there is a great potential for cell and gene therapy, but most of the currently approved ones for use, uh, for example, again, CAR T cells were evaluated in pivotal trials for less than, with less than 100 patients. So uh, having such limited data means there may be a larger than usual gap uh, between what is known about the safety and efficacy of these therapies and what clinicians need to know to judge the benefits and what payers need to know to establish sound reimbursement uh, policies, uh, which again, we, we know that it's a major challenge. So it is, it is really very important now to consider as academics who are involved in clinical development, early stage clinical development, as well as industry, uh, to, to consider you know, new measures or, or enhanced measures to improve the strength of evidence that we are generating from clinical development, uh, whether that uh, you know, the choice of more appropriate clinical endpoints, uh, how can we ensure the long-term follow-up um, uh, after the trial concludes, uh, the better use of registries, for example, for data collection and so on. So it could be it could be very important to go even one step back to preclinical development and preclinical data packages, and and to to try to have it as a more robust and reproducible as possible. 
Uh, eventually, we want to ensure that the, the efficient technologies are the ones brought forward to clinical translation. Thank you, Mohammed. I, I know we're going to run a little bit over, but I think these next two questions really deserve everyone's uh, thoughts and responses. So uh, for the first one, I'll start with Steve. A question comes from the audience. And what type of cancer do you think we'll see the next big immuno-oncology therapy breakthrough? So I would say in blood cancers, it'll be acute myelogenous leukemia because it's a true unmet need. Uh, the survival hasn't changed very much from the time I was a fellow. And we know allogeneric transplant works very well. I think that's going to be the breakthrough area. Uh, in solid tumors, I'm going to predict triple negative breast cancer based on some of my own work and what I've seen. Thanks, Steve. Robert, thoughts? Um, yeah, I think that um, in the realm of, of solid tumors, I think that the encouraging thing will be that there'll be certain therapies that will be able to touch on multiple tumor types. Um, so not so much which tumor type, but I think the type of patients that can respond to IO therapy. So I think that in the in the hopefully not so distant future, we'll actually have some therapies that can actually have an impact on PDX resistant disease, whether it's in uh, non-small cell lung, uh, melanoma, or, or other uh, solid tumor settings. Uh, and I think there are some inroads there that, um, that look quite promising. Thanks, Robert. Um, Yvonne, thoughts? Um, so, I hope it will be a breakthrough, but I know our group and many others have been working very hard on, on glioblastoma, GBM, um, because it's just such a terrible disease and really has no good treatment options. It is an extremely difficult disease, which is why I say I hope there will be breakthroughs, um, but we're all working very hard on it. And I think there are multiple IO strategies being tested in that space. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that there will be developments in that area. Thank you, Marco. So for next big breakthrough for cell therapies, I, I think most people would agree uh, with a lower bar for potentially the complexity and accessibility of the tumor. Some of those different aspects that Yvonne said were challenges that he malignancies would be at the top of most lists. For uh, breakthrough soon that could really help patients uh, to something that Robert was mentioning, I think the application of precision oncology to identify which patients may benefit from already existing therapies and or which um, modes of resistance. So these might be tumor types where you haven't had a large study, but that we understand may be robust responders in different contexts, whether by histology, mutational status, or otherwise. And then to a hopeful comment like Yvonne, I'm, I'm hoping much along the standpoint of our trials, pancreatic cancer, castration-resistant prostate, and GBM that we make some headway here. Thanks, Marco. And, and Mohammed, your thoughts? And then I'll finish it up with the last question for everybody. Yeah, I think there is not much to add after these excellent points that were made. I think expanding the portfolio for hematologic and malignancy would be something that we are all looking forward to. And I would put my money on glioblastoma as well. So I'm hoping that we get some breakthrough there. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, first, uh, I'll, I'll ask my question in the context of thanking the panel and thanking the audience. What a, what a tremendous panel, what a range of thought and, and expertise. So thank you all very much for participating. Here's my question. So we've partnered with TDG today. It was a technology development group. Um, we've been thinking about, you know, academics and industry partnerships um, and our institutions and uh, companies that we're uh, discussing uh, with, with panel members here sort of span all of Southern California. So my question is, and maybe we'll start with Robert, um, what would it take to make Southern California a leading hub in immuno-oncology? Let's see. Um, how many steps to achieve that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's uh, some of the topics that were raised, I think, um, you know, to identify where the, the key liaisons are for in the industry and academic communities. Um, I mean, we touched on that a bit in terms of uh, drug development um, and how one could do that 
an academic setting versus an industry setting. I think they have uh, realized that um, within the, uh, you know, a relatively small geographic area that there is um, the opportunity to interact fairly closely um, between the major hubs. I mean, San Diego and, and um, Los Angeles areas. But then um, to really try to focus on what arenas, you know, is it the academic community with their ideas that they're trying to get a, a foothold to see if that idea could have could play out um, in uh, in a industry application uh, to have that appropriate form, and there are some of those. Um, and then on the industry side of things, to invest in ideas, uh, so to have those interactions with the academic community to make those um, efforts fertile and and at the very earliest stages, you know, so that um, those investigators can can build upon those ideas early on. Um, but, you know, it's, I think it's forums like this so that there's a sharing of ideas. Um, you can go home, uh, think a little bit more and come back with, you know, a next iteration or, or how we could continue to, to stress these interactions. Uh, thanks, Robert. I was uh, warned that we have another session starting in 10 minutes. So maybe just your top thoughts, uh, Steve. Well, I would say between UCLA, USC, Caltech and City of Hope, we have all the talent uh, that we need. And it's really just the financial investment to essentially continue to stimulate the research that's going on and to commercialize it. Uh, it is really uh, our time. Uh, there's no question at City of Hope last year, we did more stem cell transplants than any institution in the country. And we've treated 600 patients with CAR T already. So I know just from our small institution, what we're capable of doing and then in conjunction with UCLA, USC, and Caltech, my God, uh, the sky's the limit. Thanks, Steve, appreciate that. Uh, uh, Mohammed? I can only echo what Steve just mentioned. I think we have a critical mass of excellent expertise and we can, we can uh, get the job done and be one of the leading hubs um, worldwide. I just moved from Germany, so I'm still new to the area, but one point that I think it's very also very critical, uh, which I, I, I um, notice is, witnessed is how we address racial disparities in clinical trials for oncology. And I think there's a lot of work being done in this space, and I'm very proud of it. Thank you, Marco. Yvonne? Um, I think the what makes for a hub are infrastructure, talent, and financial backing. Right. I think Southern California has plenty of space. Uh, we have more room than the Bay Area, than Boston. And so I think if the financial resources are here, we are very poised to be extremely successful. I think, as Steve and Mohammed mentioned, we have the talents here. What we may be missing is the recognition that we have the talents here. I think there, that there's a reputational gap between Southern California and some of the existing hubs that are based more on perception than on reality. And so I think there's something to be worked on in terms of making people realize that we have these wonderful institutions here training really, really good people and that this is a place where both talents and investors should put their put their resources in and build something here. Right. Thanks, Yvonne. Marco, you have the last word. All right. Well, I'm just going to agree with everyone then. Uh, incredible talent. The brain trust, the clinical experience is all there. In terms of the infrastructure, just really building out the strengths of the area, which are many, and making sure to highlight those on a national stage rather than silos, and then collaborate like crazy towards actually getting the right partners at play, and then the funding will follow. So I think now is the right time, and really excited to see what happens in the LA area. Thank you, Marco, and thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, tremendous, tremendous group of people with great brain power, and uh, again, thank you. Um, I, I know that thank the next. Uh, 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 talk symposia is going to start, I think, in seven minutes. So uh, everyone go back to your agenda, look in the lobby and get ready for the next one, the next great one. Thank you so much, everyone.